Hi, how are you, Mario? Where did you leave last week? Because I wasn't here. Uh, let's see if I marked it. I think 221. 221? I believe so, yes. That's where I have my uh, my bookmark, so I'm assuming that's where it was. Okay. Who's everybody? I don't know. Uh, let me just finish the that few minutes. I'll be back in a minute. It's Hanukkah and Rosh Chodesh. Yeah, some some people some people are in his house already, so he should be starting any minute. Uh, so I showing up. Yeah, has to have the opposite Mida, has to be up early. I mean, we were making rounds at six in the morning. Yeah, that's usual. As an intern. <laughs> uh, yeah. Program with interns yeah. and residents. Or, or very early. Here's Yaakov's. Okay. I ordered uh, a whole bunch of volume 15s for everybody. Okay. So they should be. Not even detail. It's just fifty percent. I agree with that. I mean, especially what I learned from experience. Are we on two nineteen, guys? I wasn't here. The Baruch Hashem. I think we're on two twenty one. Okay, there you go. So we did Shako. Yeah. Okay. Reciting a bracha on forbidden or non-kosher food. 221. We will discuss a question that pertains to all brachas recited before and after eating food. Should one recite a bracha if one chooses to eat a non-kosher food? Or more likely, circumstances necessitate him to consume a food that is forbidden or not kosher. Usually, it's a sick person who's been advised to eat something that might be medicinal. Right, if you must eat a non-kosher food for medicinal purposes, do you not recite a bracha? Alternative, consider a case in which a person shopping in a supermarket forgot to check the package of a food product 
for kashrut certification and mistakenly purchased and ate a food product that was not kosher. Now there obviously, he probably made a bracha. Uh, the question will be, do you make a bracha chrona? Or take a person who lives in Israel, pick some fruits off of between his backyard or elsewhere, forgets to separate trumas and maestras before reciting the bracha of aids and eating them. If one realizes the mistake immediately after eating these foods, should that person recite a bracha chrona? The Rambam and the Raivid dispute all these questions. According to the Rambam, someone partaking of forbidden food does not recite a bracha over it. Says the Rambam in Hilchus Brachas, If you ate something prohibited, whether you knew you were doing it, that's b'mezi, or you did it b'shkaga. I find it difficult to understand the Rambam saying b'shkaga. B'shkaga means you knew that it, it, you thought it was kosher. And as a shogay, like let's similar cases in, in, in Shabbos. What you do a malacha on Shabbos, b'shogay has two meanings. Either you thought it was Monday or you didn't know that that malacha was usher. So I, I, I assume... Yeah, look at footnote 13. Huh? Look at footnote 13. The Rambam's ruling that one should not recite a bracha before eating, presumably for his own other case, to where one eats the food intentionally, such as to save a life. As if one ate it inadvertently, one would have recited a bracha Normally, okay, so that's our ha'ara. The Rambam's reference to eating it inadvertently must therefore be only in connection with the rule of not reciting a bracha after eating, yeah, by which time one discovered that the food was forbidden. So we understand that, that if he ate a peshogeg, the question would really relate to a bracha chrona afterwards. Kate said, for the Rambam's aresha achal tevel shall divrehem. Mid Rabbanon was tevel means Trumas and Maestras um, should have been given. For example, uh, in Eretz Yisrael, a fruit that grows in a flower pot that doesn't have a hole at the bottom of the flower pot to connect the dirt in the flower pot to the ground. And it's an apple tree. So fruit from that, from that uh, plant is midoraisa not chayv in trumas and maestras because it's got to be directly from the ground and this is not from the ground. Midrabonon, they made you take trumas and maestras for it. So that's what he means by tevel shal divrayim. O shachal maestras rishon shalonot lutrumosa. The Maiserishon was given to a levy, and the original truma was not given. Oh, Maiser Shani behegdish shaloi niftu kilchasim. Right, it, the farmer in year number one, number two, number four, number five, he had to give truma, which was one fiftieth. Then they had to give a tenth. So let's say if you start off with a hundred, a fiftieth is two. So you end up with ninety-eight. Then you have to give a 10, so it was 9.8 of whatever to the levy. And then Meister Shaney, <laughs> now you're left with, let's say, 90. And now you have to give uh, another 10, which is another 9. So the farmer really en ended up with 81 bushels. And the Meister Shaney, Meister Risha is given to a levy. The Meister Shaney, if you lived in Tel Aviv or somewhere outside of Yerushalayim, you had to take all of that produce and eat it in your, in the walls of Yerushalayim. And if you had a lot of it and it was hard for you to transport, you could redeem it. You could transfer the Kedusha of the Maestro Shani to money. You had to add on a 20% tax. So if it was worth $100, you had to transfer the Kedusha on $120. 
And then you could leave the produce in Tel Aviv and you could eat it there. You took the $120 that now has Kedushas Meiser Sheni. You brought it to Yushalayim and you bought food there and you ate in Yushalayim. That happened in the first, second, fourth, and fifth years of the Shemitah. In the third and sixth year of the Shemitah cycle, instead of the second tithe, the Meiser Sheni, belonging to you, you gave it to Aniyim. It was called Meiser Ani, third and sixth year. Anyways, so if you ate Tevel, or you ate Meiser Rishon, the, the Truma wasn't taken from it first. Or you ate Meiser Sheni, which wasn't redeemed, according to Halach, in Tel Aviv, or Hegdish. Uh, let's say you designated an animal to be a Korban Shlomi. And he gets a mum. So you can't offer it anymore, but you can't shecht it and eat it yet. We're talking about a mum that doesn't render it a trefa. So in that case, you also have to redeem it for another 20%. If the animal's worth $1,000, you have to transfer the Kedusha to $1,200. The animal is Yotze from its Kedusha, and you can eat it. And the $1,200, you have to go and buy a new animal and bring it as, if it's Tomim, Right, you have to bring it as the Korban Shlomi that you originally wanted to bring. So the Rambam's third case is Hegdish Shloi Niftu Kel You didn't redeem it properly. You, you ate it without redemption. So in all these cases, Eina Mavarech. It means Bemezid. You decided to eat it for whatever reason. You, you don't make a bracha on it before or after. If you started eating it and someone told you, oh, you know, this is, and you made a bracha shahako on meat before you ate, and now you're told that it's usr, you would not make a bracha achrona. Ain't sarch lomar imach on the veil is a He says, certainly, if you ate the veil is a which are midoraisa, or shosayai nesa, you drank wine that was used for wine libations for Goyim. So that's certainly Kavachoymer. You would not make a bracha before or after. For us, it's going to be very, like, for example, Pesach. Chametz is usr, right? But let's say the doctor, it's a something that you have to eat. So that's the Shiloh. Because, but, but, Chometz be Pesach, it's not. It doesn't just become an iser gavra. For example, on Yom Kippur, our food is kosher. We're told not to eat this food. So on Yom Kippur, when we analyze, is it an iser gavra, iser chefz? It's certainly an iser gavra. The prohibition is on the person. After Yom Kippur, the food is perfectly good to eat. Now chometz is not like that. It's not just that you are told not to eat chametz. Chametz is aser ba aser ba na aser ba chila. It becomes like a shtick nevela. And of course, even after Pesach, chametz shaverlav chametz that went through Pesach that you didn't get rid of remains as a shtick iser. So, so if the doctor um, said that he had to eat something that was chametz stick. I think this falls into the same category. Now, according to the Ravid, the Rambam incorrectly derived his ruling from a halacha concerning zimun for eating forbidden fruits. Let's see what the Ravid says. Kaloichel dover aser ad lo betchila v'lo besof. So he's quoting the Rambam, who said that you don't make a brach. You know, the Rav, the Rav doesn't mince words with the Rambam. <laughs> he made a big mistake. By the way, this is very, this is very calm for the Rav. <laughs> the Rav can get very harsh. What the Rav says was, when they say you don't make a bracha, is you don't make a zimun. Loimar she'en lem chashivus kvius. Because zimun 
is involved with Kviyas Suda, uh, creating a Suda. You know, when you eat fruit, fruit you're not Kvei Suda over fruit. So he compares that to this. He says, why shouldn't they make a bracha? They had a no. They benefited. There is such a concept. If you eat something without a bracha, it's like you stole from a Kodesh Baruch Hu. Kodesh Baruch Hu provided these things for us. And without making a bracha, it's like you're stealing it. As the Ravid suggests, his position challenges the Rambam's interpretation of the Mishnah in Masech the Brachot. <laughs> the Rambam may have also based his position upon other sources, notably including Masech Sanhedrin, which states that if someone seeks to separate challah from bread, baked with stolen flour, he cannot recite a bracha because it is merely a provocation the Gemara might be broadly understood to refer to all forbidden foods. The Mishnah there in Brachos addresses foods whose consumption may or may not allow a person to participate in Zimun. Three, three people who ate on the same table. They have to come together and form a Zimun. However, Ochal Demai. Demai is who that belong to an Amaretz. Now, an Amaretz is a halachic definition. It's not a pejorative term. We, they were they were Chaver and Amaretz. A Chaver who, it was a person who ate his food the Tahara. He, he, he knew the laws of Tumah the Tahara. He knew how to purify himself. And he wouldn't eat his food unless it was torn. And Amaretz was the opposite. He didn't know the halach. Of Tumah Tahara, and it was assumed that anything they touched, etc., was Tumah. And even when they gave Trumas and Maestras, it was a suffix that they do it properly. So if you bought produce from an Amaretz, it's called you bought Dmai, and the suffix you had to give Trumas and Maestras again. You would otherwise you wouldn't be allowed to eat it. It'd be like Tevel. Tevel is produce which hasn't been corrected properly with Trumas and Maestras. So again, the Mishnah goes through Dmai, then Umay Sarishan Shanat La Trumaso. My Sarishan that the Truma was taken. Umay Sarishani Vehegdish and Niftu. My Sarishani Vehegdish that was redeemed properly. Vashamish Shachal Kazais. The Akusi Mizanin Ale. Even Akusi, Akusi were people, their Gerus was questionable. This is probably before they eventually considered them complete Goyim, because that did happen historically. But at one point, if Akusi ate with two others, they would have to do a Zimu. Now, these are all. Food items that may ikara din are okay. The reason we have to give trumas and maestras on the demai again is al suffic. But most of the, the Amar, you know, it's it's doubtful, but it's not mamish osr. Aval ochal tevel. If a person ate produce where trumas and maestras have not been taken, or maestrishin shalom not the trumas. The owner gave the levy his maestrisha without taking the truma. So there's in every piece of maestrisha that was given to the levy, there's there's truma in there, which you're not allowed to eat. Or maestrisheni the hegdish loy niftu, right? This is the second tithe and the hegdish that were not redeemed, as we explained tonight. And the shamis, the waiter, achal pachas mikazais, did not eat enough of a shear. In order to make the zimun, or vehanochri, a complete non-Jew, so ein mezanin aleim. So according to the Mishnah, 
one who eats forbidden foods does not constitute one of the three individuals necessary to form a zimun. The Tosfos Yontif explains that the Rabbah and Raiva disagree as to how far that Mishnah ruling goes. The Tosfos Yontif is one of the major commentaries on the Mishnahis. If you look at the Pirkei Avos or any Mishnahis, you'll see the Bartanura on one side, you see the Tosfos Yontif. So in his comment on this Mishnah, the Tosfos Yontif says, Ikim Ravusa de Savri Davke Nokat Mizamina. There are all that the Mishnah specifically refers to Dezimu and not the Ilu Bircha Sanani Mavari. He's referring to the Raivet. He's not, he's saying, but the, the Bracha before eating he would make, the Anene, he benefited. Elif Lefisha Ain Dvorma Asurin Havi Ke'elem Keval Lazamna Things that are prohibited. They, there's no kviya suda, and therefore doesn't establish the necessity for zimun. Ikem revusa de savi da africhas and enem varch mishum shenemar u botzeya barech noatz Hashem. That means if you steal something and you eat and you and you make a brach on stolen food, it, you're cursing Hashem basically, and therefore you don't make that brach either. Notably, it would seem that there's an additional proof for the Rambam's position from a parallel Mishnah Masech the Brachis regarding the Torahs used for idolatry. You don't make a Borim and Ebesamim or a Borim and Ha'esh on a fire or spices that belong to Goy. We're talking about people using all of this for idolatry purposes. The law on the air of the law of some shall mason. That means when a person died, they would light a candle. It was an Indian of the Neshama. But it was hooktsa to the mace. It means it's designated for the use of the mace. Just like mm -hmm. tachim. You're not allowed anything that is used for the mace, you can't use. It becomes Asr Bano. Like so here too, the candle, or let's say they used to put spices because they were afraid maybe as the body decomposes, it would, would smell. It's not a covet abrius, not covet a mace. So they would put spices there. So these spices are designated for the mace and it's considered hukza the mace and therefore osr bana. So you would not make brachas on those. Valal on there, valal basam, you should have Certainly, if it belongs to the idolatry itself. Here, the other commentary, as Ravadi of Bartador explains in his commentary, no bracha may be recited over a candle and fragrances of idolatry because you're not allowed to have enough from them. So, you certainly would make a bracha. How does the Ravid reconcile this prohibition with his opinion that one does, does recite a bracha when eating forbidden food? Perhaps we can differentiate between brachas recited over foods and those recited over fragrances. See the Prima Godim, who suggests two other answers to this question. Either, excuse me, the prohibition applies only to something forbidden me deraisa, but not something forbidden me to mother. A person would recite a bracha over forbidden food when there is danger to one's life, in which case it is permitted to eat the food. But let's see what regarding the source of the obligation to recite brachas before partaking of food, the more early in brachas determined that it's not derived from a verse, but it comes from logic. Elasvarahu, Adam, bracha. It's mamish a prohibition to eat food without a bracha. Tan Rabbanu, Asr la ladam sheyena min olam azeb la bracha. It there's a prohibition. The 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 bracha is a matir. There's a concept in halacha of matir. For example, when you do zrika sadam by a korban on the mizbeach, then you're allowed to eat the meat of the shlomi. 
it's a matir. It permits. When you do the 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 kmitza, when you bring a mincha, flour and oil, and you do the kmitza, and then you take a little bit of the flour and oil in your hand, and you throw it on the mizbeach, now that act allows the Kohen to eat the flour and oil. Before he does it, he can't. So that has a classification of a matir. So what's going on here now is the Gemara is viewing a bracha as a matir. That really there's a prohibition to eat food. That doesn't, that, and we have to get permission, we have to make a bracha to Hashem in order to allow us to eat it. Whoever benefits from this world without a bracha, you're over the prohibition of mi'ila. What's mi'ila? Mi'ila is when somebody benefited from hegdish. Somebody designated an animal as a shlamim, and then you went and plowed with it. So you're over mi'ila. You have to bring a korban, korban ashram, and if and you have to pay damages. 100% of the value, let's say you consumed it completely, and an extra 20%. So that's a chiv mi'ila. On Rabbi Damer Shmuel. Whoever benefited from this world without a blessing, it's as if a korban ola. There are korbanos that nobody ate anything from. The korban ola was shechted, and the whole korban was burnt. A chatis, an asha, a shlomim, those korbanos, there were certain parts, the innards and the chaylev, they were burnt, but the meat was eaten by the bailim or the kohanim. So the Mishnah is telling us if we eat something without a bracha, it's as if we ate from kotche shemayim that we're normally not allowed to eat from. Like if we ate from an Ola, Shlomim, you're allowed to eat from. Shenamar Lashem Aaret Sumloa. It belongs to Hashem. Ravlemi, Ravlevi Rami. Ksiv Lashem Aaret Sumloa. It says Hashem owns the earth. Uksiv Hashem Aim Shemem Lashem. Vars O Son of Neadam. No, the earth is given to human beings. Loi Kasha. Kan Koidem Bracha. Before bracha, the aretz is Hashem's. Kan lacha bracha. After bracha, the human being can participate. By contrast, regarding the bracha recited upon the Samim, the Gemara determines that it's learned from a pasuk. Mara zutra bartubi omarat. Minayin shemavarchan ala reya. Shenemar kol ha neshama tahalel ka. Ezehu davar shem neshama nenis mimenu. What is a thing that the soul benefits, vena goofed, but the body doesn't? That's why we smell besamim, Motse Shabbos, because we've had a neshama yaseira on Shabbos. We've had two neshamas. And now as Shabbos leaves, so the lack of neshama, you know, hurts us. So by, by smelling the reach, we sort of are revived. So it's noteworthy that the Gemara has a unique der derivation for the obligation to recite a bracha over fragrances, distinct from the argument employed to establish an obligation to recite brachas over foods. I mean, the Gemara could have said, you're benefiting from the smell how can you benefit? It belongs to Hashem, just like we said about the food. <clears throat> Once the Gemara employed natural reasoning to mandate reciting brachos over benefits, why is a fragrance not included in that analysis? So it might be argued that these different derivations generate different obligations. In the case of brachos over food, the obligation is triggered by mere benefit, irrespective of its particulars. Thus, even if someone benefits from something forbidden, one must still recite a brach. After all, one must thank Hashem for everything one tangibly benefits from, even if it's normally forbidden. The doctor says you need to eat this, and it's going to help you. So why shouldn't you make a bracha based on that svar? 
But because the bracha recited over fragrances is required due to the pasuk, which states, let every soul praise the Lord, the focus revolves around praise rather than thanks. If so, perhaps there's no reason to praise Hashem for fragrances that are forbidden to smell. Consequently, the ban on reciting a bracha over forbidden fragrances may pose no contradiction to the Ravid's ruling concerning to, to yes reciting a bracha when eating forbidden foods. What's more, after asserting that reasoning demands that a person recite a bracha before benefiting, Gemara adds that if someone fails to recite the requisite bracha, it is an offense similar to misappropriating consecrated goods, like we said, me'ila. Significantly, as the Gemara explains in the Sech misappropriating cannot apply to fragrances, which have no mamashus, means they have no <coughs> substance. Call, which is voice. Umare, a beautiful vision. Meaning, you walk by the base of Midrash, the beautiful choir, the Levim are singing. And you benefit from that. So there's no Mila, because call, you, you, you see the beautiful stained glass window of the base of Midrash. I didn't have stained glass window, but Whatever it it by if if your eyes benefited, there's no meila because it's there's no mamashus in that, there's no physical benefit. Yeah, there's neurons being excited. You know whether you with with vision or with hearing, or with olfactory smell. So there's something happening in the body, right? There's a triggering back to the brain, etc. So we can't say there's no physicality, but it's a different physicality. There are more ethereal, let's say, lack lack concrete substance. Say again. You're basically there saying the senses are at a lower level than actual eating or drinking. Well, to be chayiv me'ila requires having concrete benefit. It's just a gather in me'ila. It, we're not ruling, we're not giving a higher gate. Bernie is bothered by this concept that sensation, you know, why why is why does that have less value? It's not, it's not less value. Me'ila has certain gedorim that you have to hit in order to be high of the corbin. You have to eat a kazayas of the animal or whatever it is. So, it, be, it does he, uh, seeing and he, and hearing and smelling doesn't fulfill that criteria. Accordingly, because the benefit of fragrance is qualitatively qualitatively more subtle and does not qualify as the misappropriation that applies to food eaten without a bracha, logic alone might not demand that a bracha be recited upon fragrances if there was also not a verse. For these reasons, the Gemara provides a verse as the source for the obligation to recite a bracha. In the Rambam's view, on the other hand, the differences between food and fragrance do not overshadow that which they have in common. Evidently, for the Rambam, the verse from Tehillim concerning the bracha and fragrances is more an asmachta, an illusion, than a formal source. But more fundamentally, the simple reason that a person must bless before benefiting is equally applicable to both food and fragrance. This is clear from other statements of the Rambam in the Hilchos Brochus, in the Mishnah Torah. There's a rabbinic law to make a bracha on all foods in advance of eating them. So every bracha, every bracha that we know, that we say prior to eating, it's all midrabbanu. There are only two brachas, in fact, that are midiraisa at all. One is birchas Torah, and one is birchas amazon. So it's only a bracha after eating that has deraisa dika standards. So the midiray start for the bracha called Michael Trila. Va'achakach yen eminem. After he makes the bracha, he should benefit. Va'filu niskavin lechol olishtos. 
kolshu. His kavana is just to taste a little bit, still mavarech. Ba'achakach yene. Bechein. Right. So there is no shear. We know there is going to be a shear to bench. If you didn't eat kedei svia, which we went through already, if you didn't eat enough to satiate yourself, you're not chayv to bench. But you are chayv to make a bracha before eating, no matter how much you're going to eat. Now we're not talking about a birchas, ha, no birchas ha mitzvah like achilas matzah. So there, you're going to have to eat a kazayas matzah to fulfill the mitzvah of eating matzah. But the bracha, remember, you make two <laughs> brachas on matzah. First, you make the standard hamotzi lechem in aretz, which is the birchas anenim, which you'd have to make no matter what, even if you only ate a tiny drop of the matzah to fulfill this requirement. Then, of course, you have al achilas matzah, which is the birchas ha mitzvah, where you're not going to be bakai in the mitzvah, Unless you ate a certain amount of the shea. The chain says the Rambam. If you're going to smell something nice, you make a bracha first. If you benefit without a bracha, ma. So as the Rambam states plainly here, and in Halacha 9 1, the conceptual need for a bracha before food applies equally to fragrance. Thus, according to this approach, the ban on reciting a bracha over forbidden fragrances is just as relevant for forbidden foods. So now we have to say, how did the how does the halacha follow? Which opinion does the halacha follow concerning reciting brachas on forbidden foods? The tour quotes the opinions of both the Rambam and the Raivin. He notes that the Rosh agrees with the Raivin. The Shulchan Aruch, however, rules in accordance with the Rambam. Even if the Isser is only rabbinic, you don't make a zimun. You notice there's no Ramah. The Mishnah Burda will cite some Achronim who suggest as a compromise that if a person ate forbidden food unintentionally, one should still recite a bracha achron or bracha samazim. Imachal b'shogeg, which means you only found out after you made the initial bracha that it was prohibited. V'niskar achar achiloso das hatatz v'od kam achronim devizay yuchol v'arch b'sof. You can make a bracha afterwards. Ma'inu afinu lo'achal k'day sviya. Even if you didn't eat a satiation amount. Devizay lo shaykh no'utz. No'utz means it's disgusting to our that you're making a bracha on something that's forbidden. Then it's only notes on the Indian Zimun. Eating something in the Isra doesn't establish Kviya Suda. So it seems like <coughs> does not argue with the Shulchanaro. And even though you have Rishonim arriving in the Rosh who hold differently. The Psaq of the Shulchanach is not to make a brach. So does the ruling of the Shulchanach apply even when one is permitted to eat forbidden food, such as in the case of danger to life? The doctor tells you, you got to eat this. The Rambam, in his ruling quoted above, does not mention an exception. Moreover, Rabbeinu Yerucham rules, Rabbeinu Yerucham is also a Rishon, Rules explicitly that one does not recite a bracha on a forbidden food, even in a case when it's permitted. However, the Beis Yosef argues that the Rambam would agree that one recites a bracha rishon and bracha chron in this case. The Rosh holds like the Ravid that if you eat something prohibited, you do make a bracha. The Sham is born la Rambam enam varchalav, and over there the Rambam says you don't. But Umiyu says the Beis Yosef heicha shoyich l'davar iser l'refuas choyla near la Rambam nabi mavarchalav. Somehow the Beis Yosef 
Chapsarain, that the Rambam also would have held that you make a brach. I don't know where the Beis Yosef got it. Well, let's see. The Shulchan Aruch indeed rules that one should recite a brach when eating forbidden foods in case of danger. This is in Shulchan Aruch Archaim Reish Dalet. Wonder what sugi that is. We're in Orachayim Kuftzarik Vav. So, Ochel Michael Omashke shall Isser the Nesa Kondom of Orachal of Tchil of his soul. He says, Beferush, that if you eat something not kosher because you were in danger, so that means. The people in the Holocaust who were eating food to stay alive, were, according to this Shulchan Aruch, were making brachos on the tray food, but that was what they had to eat to stay alive. The chapter closes with a shtick machshava. So wait, if 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 that's what we mean. That you're eating it because it's a sakana. What is the circumstance that the Shulchan Aruch is talking about? That if you eat a forbidden food, um, you should recite a bracha. What are the circumstances? If it's not for a sakana, I mean, if it's not something the doctor says you must do, how are you eating forbidden food such as you're making a bracha before? No idea. Okay. The Because he said the mezid, you know that it's treif. Ochal tevel shall divrayim. Even those things you're not allowed to eat. So I don't understand why, why he would eat them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. comes out that pretty much the circumstances that we're going to deal with, you're always going to make a bracha because people are going to eat forbidden food only for a reason, because they need to. I guess. I mean, it could be that if you're doing it on very intentionally. I mean, you say, okay, I'm going to eat forbidden food, but I do I have to make a bracha? I mean, I'm so. having... The answer according to Rabbah is no. That, yeah, that, that, could, that could be the only circumstance where it differentiates. He's being, you talk to, right. He's being an Avarian. He doesn't have to make right. a bracha. All right, he wants to eat the forbidden food, but if he needs to make a bracha, he'll make a bracha, and the answer is no. Yeah. We learned over the course of the past two shirin that Chazal instituted two distinct brachas upon fruits and vegetables. Boy, pray, it's boy, pray, adama. What is the basis for this distinction? And why do fruits merit a special bracha despite being included in the more general priyadama? I mean, fruits grow from the ground too. The Bir Alocha posits that tree fruits are more distinguished. They merit their own bracha. The Bir Alocha is the Mishnah Bura. Afal gab the Gidula Menaharetz. Lorotzu Lepotram Bebichas Priyaharetz Kishari Peris Haaretz. Chazal didn't want to Potter eating fruits with the regular Bore Priyadama. Mitok Shem Chashuvim Biyosir. They're very distinguished. The Kavu Brocham Yuchedes. They established a unique Brocham. Ahazkir Shvacha Shomakam. Shabara Perus Chashuvim Ka'ela. That Hashem created these fantastic foods like fruit. In what way are tree fruits particularly distinguished? Some point to the beginning of Breshis. We are, we are told as highlighted by Ibn Ezra that tree fruits were given as food specifically to man while the animals were meant to eat vegetables. So not every animal can reach a, <laughs> I mean a giraffe can I mean an elephant can some, some animals can leap into a tree 
And certainly, certainly the human being who stands upright and builds tools like ladders you could see the fruit being designated for people and vegetables that grow low to the ground were particularly easy for vegetables to eat. And let's throw in the concept that until Noah came out of the Teva and offered the, that first Corbin and he was allowed to eat meat, that I think certainly Rav Cook learns this way, but I think even other Mephoshim learn that the intent was to be vegetarianism, that man was supposed to eat most of his food, most, he was not supposed to eat meat. It was given to Noah afterwards sort of begrudgingly. Vayom Elohim, Hinei natati lachem et kolesim zorea zera, asher apnei cholo aretz, let koleitz asher bo priet zorea zera lachem ya lachma. So that's for lachor, it's for people, the fruit of the tree. And then lachol chayasa aretz, for the animals, lachol afa shemaim, for the birds. Lachol revesol aretz, anything that creeps. Asher bo nevesh chaya is called yerek esav lachol, grass, and the things that are closer to the earth, like herbs. Says the Eben Ezra, Vayom elokim inei natati lachem, he tir livnei adam, lachol sheyesh bo nevesh chaya lachol kol esav, he permitted humanity and other types of living things um, to eat herbs. Grass is for the animals and cre creeping crawlers. He says exactly like what I was referring to, that meat wasn't even uh, permitted at that point. And we were probably going to be make do with trees, fruit. Going Rav Yosef Albo, in Sefer Ikorim, the distinction between fruits and other vegetation also played a role in the episode surrounding Cain's original sacrifice offering of vegetables. Cain gave produce of the ground instead of fruit. He demonstrated a flawed understanding of the fundamental difference between man and animal also reflected in his refusal to offer an animal sacrifice. So it says the Sefer Ikarim, Nishal, machet, machot a kind of yom priyadam aminchas l'ashem. What sin did Kain do by bringing a mincha? Shlosha shem elav el minchasam. I mean, we bring minachas in the base of Yenish all the time from flour. But what was so wrong with Kain? So it's because he brought from the inferior, which was vegetables and not from fruit. It was a tremendous punishment given to him. What's the explanation of all this? Kain was the first farmer. And he had a whole concept that the human being has no superior, superiority over other animals. The human being could plant, work the ground, and he can nourish himself with good things. The fruit is the highest. He should have brought a Corbin from that. Hashem didn't turn to that. He was far from the truth. Kayim's thought that man and animal were the same. And he didn't, he basically didn't recognize Hashem's mastery over the world. Ravalbo lived in Spain. He learned under Rav Chazdai Kreskas. The Sefer I Karim was written in 
You can read a little bit of his biography. According to Rav Albo, it seems that man's superior over animals was highlighted by the fact that only humans were allowed to eat fruit of the tree. And fruit is thus considered elevated above vegetables. Rav Victor Miller, in the discussion about Tubishvat, develops at length the uniqueness and spirituality we are supposed to absorb when eating fruit. The Gemara says that Rav Yechon Reish Lakish used to go out to Genosar and they would eat the fruit of the orchards. They ate so much until they almost fainted from overeating. Rav Yechon ate so much that his forehead was slippery. Even a fly couldn't land on his forehead, slipped off his forehead. Reish Lakish ate so much that he became wild, almost drunk, with happiness, with thoughts of the Chesed Hashem. And finally, Rav Yechon had to ask the Nasi to send policemen to take Reish Lakish home. Now we're talking about great men. So we have to understand that Gamora is telling us something here. We have to know that fruit are one of the wonderful creatures of Emuna. The Nechmada eats la skil, brings wisdom. Look at a beautiful orange or a beautiful apple. Why is the color so beautiful? Is it an accident? It wasn't beautiful when the fruit was still green, when it was sour and unripe, only when it became fit to eat. Then it turned into a beautiful yellow or beautiful red. Doesn't that show something? The fruit is trying to make you wise with awareness of Hashem. Every fruit is a demonstration of the chesed Hashem has. So when you pass a fruit stand, don't walk by like a horse walks by. Take a look. <laughs> Those delectable fruits are resplendent testimonies to the flow sabore, the wonders of Hashem. A fruit is a miracle. Every fruit has a skin around it, protects it, keeps it fresh for some time. Inside, when you finish eating the delicious content of the fruit, you find a coupon that tells you another package, the seed. You spit out that seed and it's more in the flow sabore. What that seed as inside it, it's remarkable. The seed contains more information than the most sophisticated computer. Therefore, you have to know that fruits are a wonderful opportunity to gain a muna and Abbas Hashem. And that's how you eat fruit. And when we eat fruits now, we should make a boy for eight. We'll have a better understanding. Okay, Ishkoch, everybody. Next week, we will learn Iker and Tofel, complicated Sugian Brachos, the concept of what is primary, what is secondary, when you when you have to choose what bracha to make, the analysis of what is Iker and Tofel will come into play. Have a, a Chodesh Tov and a Chanukah Tov. Next Chodesh week... Tov, Chanukah Sameach. Thanks, Sameach. And give me a... Give me a...